Welcome to the SunShot Solar Power in Your Community Workshop Presentation Series. My name is Chad Laurent from Meister Consultants Group. And I'm Jason Upal from Meister Consultants Group. Together we're going to be delivering a series of six workshops on how local governments can foster the adoption of solar power uh, by reducing the cost of solar. First up is Solar 101. The second lesson will be looking at solar ordinances. The third, understanding the regulatory landscape for solar. Number four, an introduction to solar project finance. Number five, local solar policies and programs. And finally, installing solar on municipal facilities. The key resource that we're utilizing here is the Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership Solar Powering Your Community Guidebook. Uh, it's available at solaroutreach.org. Be sure to check out that guide uh, as a valuable resource and we'll be referencing it throughout the presentation series. So in today's lesson, uh, we're going to be providing an overview of solar technologies, commercially available solar technologies, and we're going to be discussing some of the benefits that solar can bring to your community, as well as specific barriers that uh, local governments face when looking to grow their solar market. So first up, an introduction to solar technologies. There are three basic solar technologies, solar photovoltaic or PV. Throughout the presentation, if we say solar or PV, this is the technology that we're referring to, and this is used to create electricity. The second is solar hot water. Typically, the heat from the sun is transferred to an antifreeze solution, which is then used to heat hot water. And finally, there's concentrated solar power, uh, which is the largest and least common of the three. That takes the heat from the sun, transfers it to a salt-like solution, uh, which then is used to boil water to run a turbine to create electricity as well. So again, we're focusing here on solar photovoltaics, which is typically what you see on rooftops and commercial buildings, and it is used to create electricity. So solar photovoltaics panels or modules are actually made up of individual photovoltaic cells. And the great thing about solar PV technology is that it's incredibly scalable. So you can have small installations on residential rooftops all the way up to huge commercial installations on industrial facilities or even ground mounted. So when you put a series of these panels together, it's called a solar array. Now, the panels themselves are measured in terms of their capacity or power. And the metric that's used to measure these panels is the watt or kilowatts, which is 1,000 watts, or megawatts, which is 1,000 kilowatts. Now, as the sun hits those photovoltaic cells, it produces electricity. Uh, and that production is measured in terms of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. Uh, you may be familiar with this on your electricity bill. You pay for your electricity in terms of kilowatt hours. Uh, it's the exact same thing here. We're measuring the amount of electricity that's produced in that kilowatt hour metric. So just to give you a sense, uh, we talked a little bit about how solar PV is incredibly scalable technology. Uh, give you a sense of what that scale looks like. A residential system is usually uh, on the order of single kilowatt size, so anywhere maybe from two to 10 kilowatts in size. Once we start getting into small commercial projects, maybe 50 kilowatts in size, all the way up through large commercial projects where it's 500 kilowatts in size. And once you start getting into the industrial facilities, you're getting into that megawatt range. And utility scale projects, which are generally on a very large scale, maybe multi-megawatts in size. So there are a number of benefits that solar can provide to your community. There's local economic growth, uh, there's local jobs, you can't take your home and ship it to China to have the panels put on and then shipped back. So it creates local jobs for electricians and installers, uh, as well as even accountants and, and finance folks. Uh, it creates energy independence. The sunlight is free and is not coming from other states or other countries. Uh, it stabilizes energy prices, solar creates electricity during the sun, sunny, hot afternoon peaks where there's often the greatest amount of energy being used. And finally, solar provides a number of valuable assets to utilities. Because it's a distributed resource, it provides a number of benefits to utilities. Yeah, so let's actually take a look at some of the numbers here. The first benefit that we talked about was economic growth. Uh, and we've seen a significant amount of growth in the solar industry over the past six years, from just $2 billion in uh, 2006 all the way up to where it is today at almost $12 billion. Uh, so that's a pretty significant growth curve. And the great thing about solar is that most of that economic benefit is where the development is actually happening. So where panels are being manufactured, where the actual solar panels are being installed. And so the communities with the strongest solar markets see the greatest economic benefit. 
And of course, along with economic growth comes jobs. Uh, and we've seen steady growth in the solar job industry over the past six years or so. Um, between 2011 and 2012, we actually saw a 12% growth to about 120,000 jobs in 2012. Uh, that's significantly higher than the average job growth rate across the U.S., which was around 2.5% during the same amount of time. One of the other benefits that solar provides is stabilizing energy prices. As you can see from this chart, energy prices can fluctuate dramatically day to day and also season to season. Solar provides a consistent and sort of known price of energy for the life of the system, thus stabilizing these peaks and making energy prices less variable. So one of the benefits that solar provides that's actually not talked about as much is the benefit that it provides to utilities. So because distributed solar power is actually built on the site that it's being used, it requires less purchasing from the utility for other generation sources. Other benefits include the reduced investment required for transmission and distribution lines, particularly long range transmission and distribution lines uh, as we're not building centralized power plants here. Uh, and also there's uh, significantly more efficiency in terms of getting that power from the source to the actual user. So if we begin to stack sort of all of these various benefits that solar provides on top of each other, uh, what we see is that the value that solar can provide can be almost double or in many times triple the underlying value of the retail price of electricity. Uh, so this is one study that looked at what the value the solar provides in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And again, this demonstrated that the value when you stack these benefits on top of each other are twice what the retail rate of electricity is. Uh, so the more solar that you can adopt in your community, uh, the more ab the ability you have to capture some of these benefits. So we've talked a lot about the benefits that solar can provide, uh, but what does that actually mean for the U.S. market? Well, when we actually look at some of the numbers, uh, we find that the U.S. is actually doing pretty well in terms of the rest of the world. We currently have about 7.2% of the world's installed capacity. We're currently behind Italy and Germany, which actually has more than four times the installed capacity of the U.S. at 32%. So the amazing thing about Germany having 32% of the world's solar market is that it isn't a particularly sunny location. It's also a lot smaller than the United States, so there's a real opportunity in the U.S. to take advantage of a solar resource that is far better than Germany. As I mentioned earlier, at times Germany can get 52% of their electricity coming from solar resources, and we often hear a myth in the U.S. that unless I live in the south uh, or in Florida or in Arizona, solar isn't right for me. But as this map demonstrates, there's really an opportunity anywhere in the lower 48. So what does 32% of the world's capacity actually look like? Well, when we look at it on a per capita basis, we see that Germany is way far ahead of the rest of the world. So as you can see, we still have a long way to go. So not only does Germany have more solar than we do, but they're actually growing at an incredibly rapid pace. To give you a sense of this, this entire installed capacity of the U.S. solar industry at the end of 2012 was 7.7 .7 gigawatts. So over our entire history, about 30 to 40 years, uh, we've installed 7.7 .7 gigawatts. Let's compare this to Germany, which actually installed 7.6 gigawatts in a single year. So in 2012 alone, Germany was able to install the same amount of solar that the U.S. has installed over its entire history. So given there's tremendous value to solar and a tremendous opportunity, yet there are still a number of barriers to adopting solar in your community. So over the last year, we've presented over 23 workshops uh, where we have presented to over 750 local government officials and we asked them, what's the greatest barrier to solar adoption in your community? Now based on that result, number one we saw was cost. Uh, number two was lack of education or awareness around the opportunity for growing solar. And also then there was issues about financing, uh, utility support, uh, homeowners associations, but by far the greatest identified barrier was cost, or at least the perception of cost and the return on investment that solar could provide. Let's dig into this cost thing a little bit. Over the past decade or so, we've actually seen the cost of solar come down significantly. And this cost decline has actually accelerated in the past couple of years. Between 2010 and 2012, we've seen a 52% drop in the overall cost of solar. Now, that being said, uh, in most of the country, we're still at a point where the cost of solar is more expensive than the retail price of electricity. And so this is where we consider to be within stage one of the market. 
For a little bit of context, what's important to know is that the current retail price of electricity is really driven by the price of fossil fuels. So most of our electricity comes from coal, natural gas, and nuclear power. Now these resources are heavily subsidized, so it's important to remember that that wholesale and also retail price of electricity is a subsidized electricity price. All energy sources are subsidized, solar uh, a bit less than some of the other current uh, fossil fuel sources. Right, and so when you actually look at that retail price of electricity that solar is competing against, it actually is a subsidized price, and that's important to understand uh, as we go through discussing some of these barriers. Even with all of that, however, solar still has to compete with the retail price. And so really the goal here needs to be to bring solar from stage one of the market down to what we call stage two of the market, where solar is competitive with the retail price of electricity. Now, the most obvious way to do this is to actually drive down that cost of solar, such that we can bring solar into stage two of the market today. And local governments actually have a significant impact on the overall price of solar. So let's compare the cost of solar. Uh, it's useful, again, to compare to Germany, which has the world's largest solar market. And what we can see here is that the cost, the average cost of solar is about twice that in Germany. So let's figure out why is that? Well, the hardware costs are roughly the same in the two countries. That's the panels, the inverters, the racking materials. That's roughly on par whether you're in the US or Germany. There's a global market for these materials. They're produced in multiple countries. So the remaining is what we are calling non-hardware costs. And here we see a dramatic difference between the US and Germany in non-hardware costs. So what makes up the non-hardware costs? So part of that is profit, taxes, overhead, and the reason that that is uh, quite a bit less in Germany is simply due to the fact of the size of their market. So there doesn't need to be quite as much of a, uh, a profit margin for installers and developers in Germany as in the U.S. And then there's this remaining piece of the stack, which we call solar soft costs. And this is where local governments have a real opportunity to reduce the cost of solar. So this includes things like paperwork, permitting, installation labor, and customer acquisition. And so throughout the presentation series, we're really gonna focus on these soft cost aspects of solar because this is where local governments have a real opportunity to drive down the cost of solar. So where does this actually play out in the real world, these soft costs? Well, one way is in the actual amount of time that it takes to install a, sol a solar installation to go through the entire process of designing the installation, permitting it, getting it installed, interconnecting it to the utility grid, and actually bringing it online. So to give you a sense of what this looks like, let's take a look at New York City solar market. Uh, New York City, a couple years ago, actually came out with a program called 100 Days of Solar. And the purpose of this program was to bring the amount of time that it took to go through this entire process from when a homeowner or a business decided that they wanted to install a solar installation to the time when it was actually up and running down from a year, which it had been previously, to 100 days, and they were successful in doing so. Still, however, have a long way to go as compared to Germany, where many residential installations can go in in as little as eight days. So going through that entire process from when a homeowner decides, I wanna put solar on my roof, just takes a little over a week to actually get solar installed up and running. One of the barriers here that's causing this longer delay is the actual amount of time that it takes to go through the permitting process. So comparing the U.S. to Germany here, in the U.S., we currently take about seven times longer to go through that permitting process than our friends in Germany do. And as the old saying goes, time is money. And so this extra amount of time that it takes translates into 21 times the cost. So Germany was really able to achieve this by creating consistent, transparent, and standardized processes. And local governments have the opportunity to do the same. There are a number of local governments around the country that have been able to adopt best practices and implement strategies to reduce these soft costs. And so throughout the rest of the series, we're gonna be going through uh, some of these strategies and best practices and talking about how you as local government leaders can affect change and reduce these costs.